streaming. Sure you want to start the live event? We are completely sure that, that we want to, it, to start it? the live event. So apparently we are streaming and we're live. The keyword for the evening to let you all know that we're live or to let us know that you can see us is Venetian blinds. The first time we see Venetian blinds mm. in the chat, we will A, know roughly how long oh, they've... Oh, I see us. So oh, we apparently Rick sees us. And I see us, so this is good. The so I'm going to pop out the chat the here. To let you all know that we're live or to let us know that you can and see us. I'm going to stop that, close that, and we are good to go. Now, do we have any audio from the machine going out? Desktop audio, we do. I better keep it quiet. If we need it louder, we can turn that up. So, evening, Venetian blinds. That is a go. good Wonderful. sign. Good we see. have a Zoom meeting, as we have had previously. So, if anybody wants to join us on Zoom, then you can join us live here with that link there. And I think I will keep that Zoom link available at the bottom of... In fact, we could even put that in here, um, <coughs> couldn't we? We could. We don't really need it. They're not going to go typing that out. So if you need it, there you go. All right, guys. So <coughs> welcome. I don't know how many of you are here, but we'll keep an eye on the on the stream. Um, Rick is here. That's the first thing. Hey, how you doing, guys? What's going on? Actually, physically, like here. Which physically, is, it's this is not green screen. It's this not. Isn't, this is. Yeah. He's here. He's come from Australia. I'm not photoshopped into the scene. All the way over here. So hit reload on your browsers if it's not working for you. Absolutely. Cool. So we've got a little uh, structure for you, and we're going to be quite fluid as we go. So we're going to welcome you in. We'll spend until about five past next couple of minutes just welcoming people in, checking everything's working, and generally waffling. Then dive straight into prototype progress. We'll show you how we've done. That sounds good. Then what, Rick? Then we're going to go through the course structure. Have we decided that? We've got lots of uh, ideas on how it's going to go down. I think, yeah. yeah, we've got a lot to talk about there. I think, I think pending, pending your approval as an audience, we have decided that. And, uh, and then we'll be doing questions. And again, people can come in on Zoom if they want to. Yeah, I think you guys can ask questions at any time as well. I'm going to be looking at the, uh, the text here. So just fire away. And as for always, Ben's typing in how you ask a question. You type QSTN, all in capitals, and a colon. And then we'll see that as we go scanning. I don't see a search option in this window. Control though, so. F should do it for you. Oh, there we go. And then you'll find all the que questions stick out like bilio. Is that what you say in Australia? Bilio? <laughs> We do say bilio, yeah, that's yeah. very good. And would dingo you, as well. You say dingoes, would you yeah. say it in that context or is that completely inappropriate? No. Uh, bilio, yeah, it's okay. Dingo? Dingo, well, dingo, you can say whenever you like. I'll put that over there. So if anyone wants to come in on Zoom, do it. All right, guys, so what we're gonna do is we'll move into um, answering, uh, showing you our prototype progress. So let's save that up. Along the bottom of the screen now, with, as per our new production process, you are getting where we are in the video. So you can scrub the video later and see where we are. So firstly, let's show off how much work we've done. And then, uh, Very cool. well, how much input we've made at least, whether the output's any good, you guys can decide. This is basically the scope of the first section is what we have here. So I'll just zoom that out, maybe one. So if we roll back to the very beginning, uh, this is our version control system. We use Get Kraken because it's nice and, well. Nice and Kraken? Yeah, it's Kraken. It's very it? visual as well. Yeah, it's quite pretty. Yeah. So we've done, and I'll scroll through slowly, lots and lots and lots and lots of commits of work. And we've made good commit spaghetti here. And when we had last had a live stream, we were down, uh, roughly down here, by the way, for reference. So if you look at my scroll bar, that's about, uh, I don't know, about two thirds of the way through. And we've done all of this since. Rick's been doing some brilliant level building. So now we think we've got a moment to show you. What's a moment, Rick? Yeah, so here's the philosophy that we're following is when you first start making your game, rather than trying to make something gigantic, rather than trying to design a huge document, rather than trying to go for story, it's about finding that part of your game that is interesting, that's fun, that matches the player experience you're going for. And so for us, we decided combat is very important to our moment. Ben's off. Combat is very important. So our moment needs to have some sort of combat. At the very least, a character walking around, hitting enemies, and some flow through a level so that we can see what is right at the core of our game. So that's, that's what we mean by moment. It's, it's two or three minutes of gameplay experience boiled right down to its simplest. And it's supposed to look ugly at this stage. That's why I've been doing some of the art, because I specialize in ugly art. Uh, we just need you to take a photo of your face, really. Wow, that is just... Wow. Oh, yeah, that's me. You remember last time we did this, guys, and you picked on me? <laughs> and I, got in, <laughs> I got in trouble for the community from picking on... We are getting on like a house on fire, guys, I have to say. We are, we are having a great time. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. We, yeah, we definitely sing yeah. from the same hymn sheet. Yeah, yeah. Please send help. 
<laughs> yeah, please. Send it. So yeah. let's let's without further ado, lo load it up and show you uh, talk you through basically. So um, we'll start with my combat sandbox because it's boring, and then we'll go into <laughs> and then we'll go into Rick's uh, Rick's level. Uh, having fun making this game. It's very good. <laughs> oh dear. And that's also uh, we're going to talk to you guys a bunch in the course about player. <laughs> Can they hear do you have this? Your, do you have your audio I do on? have the audio yeah. on. Okay, so let's go to the actual, uh, the main level. Um, we've got, because in there we've got all the sorts of out of proportion people and everything. Okay, so where's our player start right now? Where have we left him? We've left him around the corner the here. Perfect. All right, so Rick has built for us a very early uh, world just to get some of the basics in here. Do you want to talk us through what we're seeing in the world, Rick? Yeah, so the sketch that I did, uh, I've got over there actually, the sketch was starting off high and having a view looking down as you come down into a village, there's a, a little village, a village green, and you have to run through that, have some fights, and then off to the castle to fight a boss kind of guy. So my expectation is this is about a two or three minute run through when we're working on a prototype. Later on, when we, if we use this as a proper level in the game, we would have a lot more enemies, a lot more quest hooks, uh, items that you collect, and a little bit of backwards and forwards through this area. So for now, it's just purely run through a couple of minutes um, through the village and have some fight. And because we don't have a lot of functionality in the combat, I've had to do a little bit of uh, a little bit of creative monkeying around, although I think you've gone and squashed some of my creative players. I have stretches. messed up yeah. some of your characters. You've, you've yeah. made you've made them less ridiculous, so which is fine. Absolutely. Uh, so and yeah. then so like a, an image there just to remind us of what the castle might end up looking like. Other things I like that Rick's done is just simple textual placeholders, some livestock here perhaps etc. All right, so let's crack it open. Now, how's the volume? How's the game volume from you guys? Tell us. It's very uneven. We haven't normalized any of the sound. Tell us how loud this is. It should be pretty loud. Oh, thank goodness you're here. The wizard has cast a spell on our village and all the animals have gone crazy. And I think there's a pig who's now the king down in the old castle. Yeah. <laughs> and so what we've done here is this is a really hacky way of just getting a very placeholdery that's, you know, just placeholder uh, dialogue for there would be some sort of quest conversation going on here. And uh, when we start to show you guys, guys the code and how we've done it, yeah, don't run through that again. You'll hear it all again. <laughs> there we go. Oh, it's okay. They no, can't hear it. Okay, good. I can, though. <laughs> so it's all about speed at this point. So you see up the top left, you see a little loot container up there. That's me just putting a... Uh, just an image in the scene to say there'd be some sort of loot up here just to start to get flow in what's going on in our game. Let's just have a little listen to the ridiculous noises that we've got in here so far. So over the top blood splatters. Basically this is... I'll just play it for a second then talk. Yeah. <laughs> so basically what we're trying to do here is make sure that all the relevant technical hooks are in place so that uh, we can attack enemies, so the particle effects get spawned on, on enemy damage, so that enemies have health bars, uh, so that this guy's got a basic weapon in his hand. Just the very basics of what we're trying to get in place. There's a player health bar at the bottom. It's a very general player health bar that's actually based off a couple of PSD files. I'll show you briefly how we do the health bar, I think, because it's a little bit interesting. Um, it's not that interesting, but just to give you a little behind the curtains look at how, how we're doing things like that. So we'd go to our camera and UI section, and what we've got is a player health bar PSD file here, and it's probably too small for you to see, so I'll open it up. Um, and there's a mask as well. So what you can do between the health bar itself and the mask is make your health bars look however you want them. They're just 2D art. If you want to make it look like a liquid, or if you want to make it look however. A liquid, yep. It, it could look whatever. Uh, and what it's doing is it's wrapping, come on, uh, Photoshop, open up. It's too small for you to see otherwise, so just let it open. If it doesn't, we'll just open it in Finder. I'll start doing that anyway, I think. In Explorer, sorry, I'm so used to the Mac. No, it's not going to preview in Explorer because it's a PC. There you go. So that health bar is incredibly simple, right? It's just got red and green, and what it does is it shows half of it at a time, and then we scroll the texture along. Uh, but you could put absolutely anything you wanted there, and you could also put anything you want in the mask layer, so really make an interesting effect, like some glass with some dots on it and whatever. So that's what's going on there. <clears throat> and uh, then we've got to somehow get... <laughs> <laughs> These ridiculous sounds. I've actually turned most of the sounds off so that it's not conflicting too much with our voice. Um, 
So very simple right now, it's point to click. We've also got controller. Now Sam just walked away with our controller. So if you wanna see controller movement, I'd have to go downstairs and uh, get that. But basically it works very well so far with controller. It's a direct left stick movement with controller. Yep. I've got a question for you guys. What proportion of you guys play, when playing your PC, use a controller? So what proportion of you, when you're playing your PC, would you, play, would you like to play a game like this with your controller? If you just say controller on mouse and keyboard, in the chat. I shall bring the chat front and centre. I'll put it on the left because it's easier to do. Uh, yeah. When, when, you, when you play Steam games, particularly RPG type games, do you play with mouse and keyboard or do you play with controller? I'll use primarily controller. That's just one though. Controller, okay. Mouse keyboard. Mouse keyboard. See, I'm, I'm really pushing yeah. for controller compatibility here and trying to make sure that, that, that you can play this game on the sofa. As soon as we can get it updating through Steam, I want to go downstairs in the evenings and play the up-to-date version of the game on the, on the couch. Um, Rick and I have been playing Diablo on the PS4. It's been working very nicely. Yeah, very good. Nice and relaxed. Um, okay, so more mouse and keyboard as you'd expect. You are PC gamers after all, and some controller. Okay, wicked. Yeah. So the prototype, should, I don't, how much more behind the scenes should we give them, Rick? Um, I mean, yeah, a little bit more. Yeah, a little yeah. bit more. So um, what do you want to know? I guess a little bit about a lot of it, right? So we talked last time a little bit about the way the camera's working and it's ray casting and it's telling you what it's hitting and it's working stuff out there. So we'll leave that out. Um, we've got separate levels. So what we're doing here is we're trying to reduce the contention when we're, using, uh, when we're working with other people. So we're trying to make sure that Rick has his level, I have my level, etc. But most of you are working on your own, so we won't bore you with that. I've got a variety of different enemies for now because we haven't got the enemy art style. We've just got big enemies, um, medium enemies who are fat and distorted, small enemies, and uh, they're all ready to go. Now, these enemies have already got quite a lot of stuff on them. Let's just take a look at an enemy here, enemy Houge, which is huge. We have a model child to that so that you can rescale the enemy without messing up things like the UI. We have a UI socket, but that UI socket doesn't actually have, there's no UI here in the editor, you'll notice. What the UI socket has on it is a script and a link to an NPC canvas. And then what we're doing is we're putting all of the enemy UI, the health text, which we've suppressed now, the health bar, the damage points. When, when you hit people, they actually have a number of uh, points of damage come above their head. I don't know if you noticed that. But all of that is gonna go into a single canvas here, which at runtime, the enemy will spawn into his UI socket. So it keeps the editor tidier. Also means that we only have a single NPC canvas to edit for all enemies. Mm -hmm. So that gets around the fact that Unity doesn't have nested prefabs. And then we have a hit particles thing as well, which is where the code is going to go and look for that child and say, I'm going to go and fire off the hit particle effect. And we'll have various other particle effects later. So it gives you an idea what the NPC is like. Any feedback on the NPC, Rick? Uh, yeah, I think what I was thinking about just then when you asked that question was uh, a lot of when we start to make our game, we try to make it big, we try to make it properly. And what the emphasis we've got here at the moment is just get something working. And what's the absolute basic thing we need to do? You have to have an enemy. What's the most basic thing an enemy needs to do? It needs to run towards the player. We could have them just standing there stationary, but that's a bit boring. Run towards the player and attack. So up until I think yesterday, it's just been the player and the, and the enemies just kind of mushing together like that. And it didn't feel very much like a moment. So what we're working towards with this very, the stage one of the prototype is to play and feel like I'm a player and I'm smashing the enemies over the head. They can potentially hurt me, my health goes down, I can hurt them, and I'm trying to get from A to B without dying. And so I think the changes you've made today in terms of having some, some effect when you hit them not necessary, not critical in terms of that experience of I just need to kill the enemy, but makes it feel like we're actually killing the enemy. And this is something that I'm sure you guys wrestle with when you're working on your games is how much of it is, how much of the polish do I do now is important and useful and how much of the underlying architecture do I do and how much am I building for, for long term. And the balance we want to show you guys is to to not project too far forward with your game. Just look, I need to get from here to here, you know, in whatever, two or three weeks time, just to architect for that three week chunk and just to create the design for that three week chunk and just to create the, the amount of, I guess, polish for that three week chunk and not to get accidentally uh, distracted by what am I trying to do way down the road. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. And Rick's been really instrumental with that to keep, 
keeping that process on track, it really helps you focus on, the, on the what's just ahead and make it all feel achievable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the other sort of things Mikey's been playing with is creating things like these growing mushrooms. These are all animatable mushrooms. Uh, you have a, a blend tree parameter here. So um, we're going to be showing you two different types of animation. One is rigged animation, skeletal animation, but the other is morph target or blend shape animation. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going on here. And that's where you just morph between two different uh, sets of vertices, you know, two layouts of vertices. But this is, that's one example, but that doesn't really show it. That just looks like we're scaling the mushrooms. They might grow up as we walk into them. But what we have got as well is a pulsing blob. And uh, the animator controller is not available for this right now because it was just a test of something. And I was trying to decide whether to teach it to you at this stage, but I think we will. And uh, what we've got with the pulsing blob is you've got two different keys here and they're morphing between two different dimensions of deformation. And it allows you to come up with all sorts of totally non-skeletal animations. So we'll be teaching that as well, blend shape mm -hmm. animation and using those. Mm -hmm. Cool. So that will be cool. And you guys have probably noticed already, we Oops. didn't mention it, but just using a lot of the standard Unity assets, so the Ethan, the character that's running around, as a quick win, let's just drop him in quickly and have him run around. And we're starting to get to the point, we were talking about this today and yesterday, we want to have him swing and hit, but the amount of energy it would take for us, or time it would take for us to actually go and animate Ethan yeah. in something that would be ultimately throwaway. So that's why the sword is just kind of doing its its thing a little bit held on, but it's it's not trying to be precise, just sort of to get the feeling across good enough. Yeah, exactly. The sword just sits in Ethan's hand, on his hand bone now, and just moves with his hand bone. So uh, as he runs, it just, uh, that was my son. I'll <laughs> turn the sound game audio up a little bit because it is funny. So it just sticks with it. Um, and then what we're doing for the moment, but we're going to, to do this differently, would be probably in the second section of the course, is he just swings that, but we'll get into further animations later. So <laughs> crazy sound, Some crazy sound We've uh, changed Ethan's uh, default animation systems a fair amount just to make them simpler. So running is a much simpler blend tree between various different states and things. Actually, so. that's, that's a point for me to ask a question in terms of ha how many of you guys, this is a yes, no, have you actually, it's probably a how much have you played around with the animation system in Unity uh, to the extent that Ben was showing you just there. He was looking at Ethan's um, states. We've gone somewhere else. But just... Just to a quick, you know, couple of uh, words or two on how much you've worked on in Unity in the animation system, like a little bit, a lot, a great deal. You know it very well. You don't know it very well at all. Just so we get a feel where from where you guys are coming from, because there's a lot of the focus of what we're doing now is the design and the coding, and not so much on the art. But there's a lot of actually just making the character work that you're having to get in there and monkey around with the animation as well. So yeah, yeah. it's interesting to know how much we stretch that. Yeah, and all humanoid animations in Unity are retargetable, so we can go and get an animation pack mm -hmm. uh, for like hack and slash movements off the asset store, yeah. and uh, then we can retarget those in for you. So I'm going to assume you guys aren't too au fait with the animator when we start when we start working with this. Yeah. But, but his basic states are going to be this: he'll have, you know, he'll be idle unless you tell him to do anything else. So there he is sitting in, and oh, we need to unmaximize. There he is sitting in an idle state here. And then he can move to over, to, we're not actually looking at the player right now, there you go. So he'll be run, running when he's running. Uh, obviously he can move to attacking, but there'll also be the ability to do a die from any position. So we'll come from any state into a die animation. And we can also allow for multiple idle animations. We're thinking about mm -hmm. if he's standing still, he'll kind of scratch his face or do some weird things. Look up certain at the types of maneuvers, yeah. maybe a willy helicopter <laughs> um, or something. Something like that, yeah. And uh, he'll be, yeah, he'll be doing fine, right? Yeah. So uh, lots of we're doing lots of stuff where we where we um, where we randomize sounds. So you already saw before that we have a load of different things he may say at the beginning of the game, a load of things he may say on death, and now he has snonk sounds. <laughs> uh, snonk is a word Rick came up with instead of damage. I, I have no idea why. Didn't you come up with snonk? I think it was your word. I see. Okay. Yeah. So it's pretty original. Yeah. Um, so that's that. So I think um, I would just ask any questions on the on the on the prototype, but this is close to the scope of the end of the first section, which will probably be the actual first section of the course. We'll talk about the course structure in a minute uh, in terms of this f feedback, uh, the structure that's gonna be next. We're currently talking about- So the probably the first process. few hours of the course, right? Yeah, the first few hours of the course will be that. Guys, what are your questions on the course structure? Will we be importing animations from Blender? First question mm. I see here. Yes. 
Yeah, good one. Good answer. <laughs> uh, a lot of these animations are crea effectively created in Blender. We'll be able to deal with both read-only and non-read-only animations. If we look at this player here, you see that a lot of these came with Unity. They're read-only because they come from an external package. All these animation keys here are uh, can't be changed in Unity. And then we'll also be dealing with uh, animations that we have crafted or changed in Unity. So, yes, we will be dealing with a whole workflow of importing uh, assets with animations. Good question, that man. And I don't know if anybody's on Zoom yet. I could have a look. I um, don't think we need this window open anymore. I could tidy up my screen. But anybody here on Zoom? No, not yet. If you want to join, then you're welcome to. We can repost the join link if you want. Here it is. I'll go post it in the chat. Next question on the prototype. While we wait for that question, I should say... Uh, Discord has gone nuts, so if any of you are uh, have not yet joined our Discord server, then I will give you the link for that now. Just go here. I'm sure you are all on there. Boom. And then this is Discord, and if we go into the lounge, for example, it's nearly 700 people online, making it one of the busiest um, <laughs> gaming uh, live chat servers around. So awesome. Thank you for your support on that. That's Discord. All right. Back to the meeting in Zoom, just in case anybody wants to join. I don't know where it is. Where's it going? There it is. There's nobody on Zoom. All right. Any other questions on the prototype before we start talking about how we're going to teach the course? I think there is a delay. We've got about a 30 second delay, so we need to do a little bit of filler, 30 second of filler. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think back to the, I'm, I'm probably going to talk about the player experience a lot. And part of what we're trying to do with our particular game is uh, it's going to be different or not necessarily, but you guys aren't necessarily going to do what we're doing, which is to create a game that's funny, that's a bit silly, that's a bit ridiculous, so that we can keep it light and entertaining and interesting as we're building our own game and you guys are following. I think if it's too heavy, it's going to get uh, you know a little bit too... Uh, a little bit too slow. So we're keeping it light and we'll probably be goofing around a whole bunch, putting some silly words in there, silly names, silly sound effects. But that's not to say that you guys obviously need to follow that approach. That's just what we're doing for our particular game. You can make it very dark and very, you know, dark and devils and demons and, and uh, you know, blood splattering everywhere and mysterious if you want. That's totally the direction you can take it. And we encourage you to take your own direction, of course. Yeah. That's the yeah. point. Okay, so I'm not seeing any questions coming through there, so we will move on to the next bit of the stream, which is the course structure. Just before we do that, I would like to find out what, what the delay actually is here. So if uh, you could type the word clap, but don't hit enter yet, C-L-A-P, clap, because uh, I'm going to clap my hands, but don't hit the enter key. So a few of you just get ready. I oh, will answer that question in just a sec. A few of you get ready, the word clap written in, but don't hit enter. And then in, I'm going to clap in, in a second, and I just want you to hit return when I hit clap. So three... Two, one. Oh, Rick just did it. Clap. Oh, that probably broke it completely because they've just. You guys have just seen me type clap before we've got to the point where we're saying clap. Oh, I broke it. I'm such an idiot. That's okay. We can see it's about 20, 15 seconds. Okay, cool, guys. Are you still pursuing the community asset contributions? Yes, we will, Ninja Chimp. We are. Yeah, not quite yet there yet because the art. Uh, the art style is not pinned down, so Mike will be working on art while we are moving forward with the teaching of this bit of the prototype, and then in, in a couple of weeks or so, we'll be putting that out. So. I think that's going to start to happen really soon, actually, because if you have a look at what we've got in our... I think it's in Mike's sprint plan for this week to reach out to the yeah. community. Yeah, but it just at looking at what we've got now, I think we could put in some actual you know, half-decent particle effects when the player gets hit. Um, that if someone wants to start playing around with particle effects and make something decent for us, then that's the kind of thing that it's ready for us to put in there. Yeah, yeah. so even at this stage, guys, if you want to send us over <laughs> any, then let's make a little uh, section on the uh, community site, and then let's just open up for you guys, we don't want to go to that, uh, to go to, to give us community contributions right away. So just give us some, I'll put it in the early access only, and I'll just say early con community contributions, and you can just link us to the assets in the comments of this. As long as they're assets that you've created. That's the whole point of this. If you want to create something and have it feature in a game and in the course as well, then this is the place to do it. Don't go and get an asset pack. Don't give us a link to this is a really cool mod that we might want to check out or a really cool uh, site. It's just purely something that you yourself have worked on and created. 
And as we go, because you're in the early access area, you can see a lot more of what we're trying to do. Uh, if you want to go and have a look in the GDD, I think a lot of you guys have already poked your head in there and had a look. Also, the, the art design document. So GDD is game design document, the art design document. Have a look in there and give us some, some ideas, your thoughts, your feedback, um, and just any contribution you want to make at the moment. It's really cool because we're making this game together, I think. It's, the end product is going to be a, a big mush of everyone's ideas um, to yeah. create something that's really cool. Yeah, very, very well designed and clearly directed mush though of course yes good tasting mush absolutely good yeah. mush okay cool so let's move on to the course structure so what we've decided to do is make one course <laughs> um, not to focus too much on asset creation because that's not really what it's about it's not what the kickstarter talked about but to focus on the two main things which is development and design uh -huh. and rick and i are just simply going to work together on the same course we are going to teach it in a standard way where we use a repository to keep track of the course. So if you look at, for example, I don't know, Z a Bull Cow Game over in the Unreal course, it is literally the repository that you guys have access to is just like lecture after lecture after lecture. And we just go through uh, step by step. So what we've got in terms of our current, all this is just a prototype. And we will start right back here. In fact, we've already got the branch called Course, and we will start building it in front of your eyes from scratch. You'll see the entirety of our game come together in strict order, in chronological order. Uh, but we will, of course, be pulling a bunch of here's that's something we made earlier in, uh -huh. um, where we think it's not a benefit to you in terms of learning how to make an RPG to make to do that thing. Yeah. But you will, we will be a step-by-standard, standard, step by step no, no, nothing missed, uh, you know, controlled by version control type of course. So. I, I'm pretty interested as well in terms of how many of you guys have actually started working on your RPG. How many of you are coming into this completely fresh, waiting for us to get started? And you know, I know a lot of you are saying, when are you going to get started? When are we going to start seeing the course? Uh, so if you're in the, the camp of, I'm just waiting, I haven't done any RPG things yet, then let us know that. Just type it in, nothing yet. But if you've started to think about your game, if you've designed something, if you've written up some ideas, uh, if you've created something, if you've already been working on an RPG for a year and you're looking for us to give you some extra you know, extra input on that, then just let us know what stage are you at, how much have you done already in terms of an RPG. That'd be really useful for us to know in terms of the conversation we're talking to you guys about. Ah, oh, Teapot, you're killing us with your waiting. I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry about the slight delay here, but it's not too huge. We've done a lot. What happens is when we've done a lot of prototyping like this, just like with the Unreal course, then suddenly the, the gates open and uh, all the teaching comes out. Um, writing some dialogue, good, good idea. Nothing programmed. Written concepts and idea. Designed art and character. Cool. Sketches on paper. All right, so you guys are looking forward to just getting into the course. We will start shipping course content and recording course content next week. So uh, we will wait until we get to at least half an hour before we put it through Unity certification, then we'll get it out to you. So the intention is to get you guys a basic be beginnings of the course, just a, you know, probably less than an hour of content, but enough for you to get started by the end of next week. And then you will be able to um, just follow along with us as we produce the course, which we'll be doing pretty fast after that. Cool. And yeah, it looks like a lot of you are saying waiting, done a little bit of thinking. So what I want you to think about, here's a, here's a challenge for you, an action between now and the course going live, is to think about what sort of RPG are you making? So is it, is it going to be uh, third person the way we're doing with the fixed camera? Are you going to have a movable camera? We'll show you how to do that, even if that's not in our game. And what's the experience you're going for? How do you want people to feel when they're playing it? Is it going to be you know, intense? Is it going to be very fun and friendly? Is it going to be bubbly? Are you going to make it you know, a thousand different skills and abilities that you want players to learn? So start thinking about this, that at this point. If you already know, feel free to, to chat it away to us and give us a bit of a summary on what your game is going to be. But by the time the course drops, that'd be a good thing for you guys to have clear in your head. This is the kind of vibe that I want from my game. Yeah, of course, Rick will be taking you through all that because... Uh... It's going to be a step-by-step -step course. But, yeah, yeah. But, but if you can, you know, your early access, we want you ahead of the game in terms of knowing what the game's going to be. We have already had your input and your kind of approval for this type of idea. And as it moves forward, we'll start to be getting your feedback and approval on the, on the uh, pedagogy, which is the technical term for teaching of it. Mm -hmm. so. Wonderful. Cool, 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 cool. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> World of War starts... Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, cool. So not too much more to say on the course. It's going to be a single course on an intermediate level course on how to make an RPG. 
Um, and we'll be teaching intermediate stuff across the board, intermediate Unity, uh, intermediate C Sharp, intermediate game design, yeah, mm -hmm. et cetera. Yep. Cool. All right, so let's just see what type of stuff they've got coming. Hack and slash, nothing yet. Okay. Well, the whole process will be there. A large part of the early stuff will be, you know, how do we even decide where to start? Yeah. And Rick's going to be working through you with you with that with you. Okay. So how are we doing for time? Let's have a little look at the Don't watch. Really well. Half an hour. We've only done half an hour. So this might end up being a bit of a quicker update than previously, because um, we have somewhat less to say. Although we've been busy doing a lot. So any technical questions that, that you're really wondering now, uh, are you going to cover this or how have you done that in the, uh, in the prototype? That would be a good question because uh, uh, particularly how have you done that in the prototype type of thing would, would be really good to help us to understand uh, where your questions and concerns are and help us pace ourselves um, when it comes to teaching you. So that'd be cool. Question, Ninja Chimp Studios, who uh, I think holds the record for most questions that I've seen asked. Oh, I think so. Uh, Although, no, sorry, Steve got in there first. Uh, question, will the first lectures be more jump in, hands-on, build the game, or more about setting up design? That's a good question, and something that I think we've talked a lot about. From our point of view, it needs to be both. If you well, well, hold on, before we answer, should we, sorry to interrupt. Oh, yep. Um, should we ask them, what, uh, Steve, what's the intention behind that? In fact, what as a, as a whole is your intention behind that? Um, just reply with jump in or set up and design. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what would you prefer we started with? We've got a strong idea as to what people prefer, but it may be wrong. Mm. So do you want us to sit and talk about the design, et cetera, um, and to get you all set up in initially, or do you want us to be diving in as early as possible into the engine and then mixing the other stuff in? Let me know. Yeah, there's probably a good, everyone can comment on that as well, I think. Yeah. Okay, so uh, in the meanwhile, while we wait for their comments to come back on how, how, how they'd like us to start, um, are we going to cover cinematic in-game, in-engine cutscenes? Probably not, because we're not planning on a lot of loading times being necessary here. Um, so we'll use level streaming if necessary to get the next stuff in. So probably not, but you, it's quite easy to do a cutscene like that using an animator on the camera uh, Ninja Chimp, so it's not too tricky. I, I think we'd probably talk about the foundations of it, even if we don't do a lot of that for our game. We'll, we'll at least talk about his, I assume, his how to pause the game and move a camera, right? Yeah, but whether we'll show them actually how to make a movie using the animator, only if we need to. Right. You know, um, yeah. And I can't, it depends how long the level loads take and what we want to do in terms of setting the scene story wise in the beginning. Mm. And will it be multi level? Yeah, as in multi scene, yes, we'll be needing more than one scene in the game. When are you going to start the dialogue system? In the course, it won't be in the first. The first thing is just to get a combat moment because that's kind of the core. Um, probably second or third section, we'll get to that. Um, are we going to introduce game programming patterns? I've got the book right there on the shelf. Uh, yes, as necessary. Uh, we don't obsess about patterns, but uh, we will bring them in and talk about them as we need to. Um, okay, jump in, more design. My preference is jumping in, set up and design. Uh, set up summary at most, then jump in. Seem to be the jump in method, jump in, set up and design before jump in. Okay, so uh, what we're planning on doing is jumping in, uh, but also weaving the design in from very, very early on. Mm -hmm. So the lectures would go something like, you know, welcome to the course, this is how to use it, this is your orientation, this is how to get the most out of it, this is where to ask your questions, then straight away into... Um, all right, what's the one-page game design document, mm -hmm. um, which Rick will go through with you. Mm -hmm. um, and then Rick will talk to you a little bit about uh, where you even start with a game like this, and, and that is what? It's the moment, which we've talked about before. Mm -hmm. And he'll define what that means. And then we'll go, well, look, if you're going to start making a moment, let's start getting in there and thinking about uh, what that means. So you will get into actually building the basics of that moment, the basics of a third-person scene, etc. Um, and then as we go, we'll start to go back to the design documents and flesh them out into 10 pages and then larger um, and basically jump back and forth between design and doing um, as necessary so that the, des the doing can influence the design and then the design can influence the doing yep. and that it's not trying to filter just down from the top. Oh, will it be multi-level physically? Enterable buildings where roofs are invisible? Cape? Yes, we will have some of that stuff, absolutely. We will have enterable buildings and we will have that, that type of thing. Yeah, Mike has already got a dungeon test level. He started to look at how dungeons 
Uh, it's not actually an internal dungeon yet, but he started to put together platforms and dungeon work tiles, starting to look at how the modular world will work. So, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. So, where's the questions? Not there. I'm going for point and click movement, um, then jump into ray casting and nav mesh. Um, yeah, exactly. So, you know, the, the player clicking and then how do you tell the player to go to that point? And we're not using, uh, we're not using uh, any pathfinding on the player, by the way, because you just don't need it, we've discovered. There's a lot of issues when you start getting the player to pathfind to where you've clicked. And the reality is you just don't need it. If I want to go from, say, here to around this corner, if I click and he runs, he'll stop. He won't continue to do this later. At the moment, this doesn't matter for our early combat demo. We will prevent him from continually running into things like that. But what we don't need to do is allow him to navigate himself around it. NPCs, however, do need to navigate around things because that's how they've got no intelligence to drive them otherwise. So there is a navigation mesh. It's all the blue stuff you see here but we're not planning on having the player use it at the moment, unless we find in gameplay later that we need it. But it just doesn't seem to be necessary. That is an unknown, I think. And yeah, this it's is an something, unknown. This is something at this early stage, if we spend too much time pondering that and worrying about that, then we'll, we'll get stuck on it. Uh, I, I, I can see we might need to do some pathfinding. Just the, the example you had there, if there's a small, you know, small edge and you can't walk around the side of it, it's going to feel a little bit unfriendly. So really, it's once we put the game or the prototype in front of people and they're clicking around, if people get stuck and get stuck and get stuck, we won't have a choice. We'll need yeah. to do it. And that, that's a lot of, lot of us trying to show you guys as well. Don't design your game too heavily up front. Just get it in there, get it working, get something people can play with, and then respond to player feedback so that you're making a strong game for the player, not just what you think is kind of cool in your head. Yeah, exactly. A huge amount of this will be about trying to help you to manage what you're thinking about mm -hmm. um, and to focus on what matters. Now, Brian, in answer to your question about why not on the player, a couple of good reasons. One is um, that when you start thinking about clicking on a place on the map and then having the player move to within range of an enemy, what does that mean? So uh, if I'm here and I want to click and... Let me just turn that down. And I want to click down. If I click down there, for him to head towards it makes sense. But if I was to click click somewhere where you've got to take a really strange route and he starts running like backwards, then he can end up needing to go off screen, <clears throat> off the current screen to get to where you've asked him to go to, which we were saw, seeing in my combat demo. So let's actually, there's a geometry in my combat demo, which you can, you can get rid of through level design. But we don't want to have to get rid of it through level design. So the classic example before was if I was to click here now, up here on this brown, would we really want him to run around the edge here and go off screen to get there? That feels weird. And it gets rid of the whole aspect of exploration where you where you navigate your own guy around the world. So then you can write code, and I have got it in the in the history there. You can look at it on GitHub that actually says, well, let's look at the navigation points between where we are and where we're saying we want to get to. And if any of those go off screen, then don't bother trying to navigate. But then you've got this kind of really cut down navigation system, which starts to feel a little bit odd. And you start to quite quickly say, why do we even bother with a navigation system? You've also got the whole idea of what is the distance between me and the enemy? We're we talking about the straight line distance. Are we talking about the navigation distance? Um, and we and that so that confuses things. And you know, for example, if I'm standing, um, if I'm standing here, like where I'm wiggling my mouse, <clears> and I want to go to here, then there's a part. Navigation distance is a long way. The straight line distance is very short, and you've also got slope distances to think about. So it makes it a lot more complicated when it comes to getting in range of an enemy. And finally, the controller. The game is also wanting to be very, very compatible with direct control. And you click a button, you go into direct control mode. If you've got pathfinding, you're obviously going to have to disable that when you're in direct control mode. And if we start using good pathfinding too much, it's going to affect the gameplay balance between somebody playing on a keyboard and somebody playing on a controller. Mm -hmm. And I, would, I don't see any need for it yet. We may need it. We might just do <coughs> some basic avoidance that can just go around little lumps without a full pathfinding algorithm. Yep. So we'll see. But starting as simple as possible, that's the point. And it's also cool that in my level there, the test level we've got... Um, I think it was yesterday I made some changes to the collision and it doesn't seem to be in there anymore. But the whole, there's the rock and the players getting stuck here, that I, I, that'll, that'll be fixed. It's looking a little bit yucky at the moment. But oh yeah, there's, lots there's of some, yucky. some collision tidy up. 
physical levels, yes. Will there be lectures on, so try and, uh, the, the Shu one bang, <laughs> try and prefix with QSTN in case this gets really busy like it has before and it will help us find things. But I did see your question there, I think, and it said something like, <clears throat> I prefer plus only on the player, otherwise you click somewhere and you get stuck and maybe the site is bad and you don't know how to get out. Um, yeah, getting out is normally easy. You just go back the way you came, and the sight of them running against things looks rubbish, but we can suppress that other ways to do with testing for whether we're making progress. Uh, orbiting around the player, we recently said we probably, we've got the control space, the right stick on the controller. We will probably give you a pan and tilt and orbit camera, um, and then if you, uh, and in our game, we'll probably turn it off. Um, or we might make it, turn it off by default, but make it a player selectable free view camera or something. It's very yeah. trivial to do that, actually. It's more of a design decision, as we mentioned before. Yeah, that's one of those things that I think if you can pick your genre early on and, and lock it in and stick with it, because we know games like Diablo have proven that it's enjoyable to play a fixed camera. Like It does work as a game. It's a particular style of game. But it's also cool to have a third person with the camera rotating around. It's also cool to have where the camera kind of just comes in on a... I don't know if you guys can see me there, look on the monitor, where the camera is fixed and you can't rotate, but you can come in closer to get a closer view. And also when you're down lower, you can see off in the distance. So there's a few different ways and we'll show you guys how to manipulate the camera, even if in our game we go for a fixed camera, just to keep it, you know, to keep the scope down, but also to keep it fixed to a particular genre. And you guys talk about point and click without pathfinding being goofy, but even the mighty Diablo, pretty much has that. I'll just show you again. We did talk about this in the last live stream. <coughs> but it doesn't really pathfind properly. It just goes pretty much straight to click, mm -hmm. um, which is surprising. And one of the reasons I realized that actually, you know, maybe it can be that simple and that will work be fine. So we'll let Diablo load up and see if we can just crack it out. Um, where's the play button? Game is running. Oh, game is running. Okay. No, it's not. It's waiting on another installation or update. All right, well, we'll come back to that. Well, there, there was a question while we're coming back to it, question on uh, that we sort of nearly answered. Will there be lectures on creating the level world? Uh, I think that's, also, that's a good one for you guys to give us some feedback on how much you want us to pause when we're going through the content and to, to look a lot more uh, in detail at level design. It's something that we'll definitely talk a little bit about level design. And the level that I've created there, I'll take you through the logic in this prototype level of why I created a certain way, what we should be looking for, what's important for the experience. And if you guys are saying, yeah, I want more of that depth in terms of how do you lead the player through the level? How do you decide where to put the enemies? How do you decide you know, what part of the level to be tuning so that you've got the difficult enemies? Uh, how to place the things to pick up, etc. If you want to see under more depth, then I think that'd be a cool thing to spend some more time on. Um, probably not a huge amount of time, as much as would be in a dedicated level design course, but definitely more than just, hey, go off and make some levels and see how it goes. Cool. So, so Herr Schwartz, you're saying, what, what's the tool we're going to be using to build the global map with? Can you just clarify that question? We'll have to do something to fill while we wait. Do you mean like a 2D map that we use to, to navigate between different areas of the world, Diablo style? Or uh, and in which case, Mikey will create that 2D map in something like Photoshop, and we will just import it and then insert assets just UI on the top no, of it. Nodes along it, I guess. Nodes. Yeah. Or do you mean what tool are we going to use for creating the world inside the game? In which case, we were going to start by blocking that out with Unity's Terrain Editor combined with blocks as necessary and some custom mesh. Um, whether we need to go to full custom mesh made in Blender for the world to, mm -hmm. will depend on the frame rate and performance that we get out of Unity's tools. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting as well that there's there's a bunch of cool level design tools out there. I don't know if you guys know about Pro Builder, and uh, I've, I've been looking a little bit lately. There's a free version of it, which is handy. It helps you with some of the, the blocking, So particularly so you can move vertices right within Unity. You don't have to go out into a tool like Blender to do that. But one of the mandates we have for the course is creating, uh, having everything free, so not using any plugins that cost money, not saying to you guys, hey, here's this really cool thing that's it's only $100, go get it. It's just all purely about what can we do with Unity's tools or anything that's free and reliably going to be around. So if we suggest that you use it, it's not going to go out of business. Yeah, unless we can get some sort of deal for it. Okay, so if we look, let's look at how uh, this lady moves around here in Diablo. So I'm holding the mouse down. She's moving towards the mouse cursor. But if there's an obstacle like this and I click here, you see, look, she's even in Diablo, look. 
She's not trying to run when she can't move, but she can't even get around that. Oh, that's because it is completely locked. Okay, let's go somewhere where there's actually a possibility of her getting around. <laughs> let's use around. this fence here as an example. Yeah, what about if she's there yeah. and you tell her to go there? If we tell her to go there, she'll do a little bit of going around. But that's if so she's good. here and we tell her to go there, she'll, she'll quite happily get stuck, you see? Even in Diablo. So... Um, so it's a little bit of it's just a little bit of a around a corner, but not, but it's super not pathfinding. full pathfinding. So it's not really that necessary if you've got responsive controls, because effectively moving the mouse around you lets you go in any direction. So we'll, we will introduce the more complex system when we need to. Everything we do is going to be about justifying through our actions why it's necessary to do that. So we're not just loading stuff on and always doing things the way people always do things. We want you to understand from the ground up why you're doing it that way and why you're going to that trouble. Oh, none of them could see Diablo. Oh, okay. Well, just trust us. Diablo <laughs> does kind of a half pathfinding. Maybe we should do some... So we're running around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, that, they, they will often get stuck, even though there's a very clear path around the side on the screen. So if you've got... Um, what I need to do is know what I, they can see, so I need to get OBS open. There you go. Maybe you can use this as a prop. Yeah, well, so anyway, what we were showing in Diablo was if there's something sticking out and you click here then she'll go around, yeah, you can probably see there, go around a little bit, but if you're here and you click there, then she wasn't going the whole way around. Yeah, even though there. the screen is here, so yeah. so you could be here, wanting to go there, and she'd just get stuck here, yeah. even though it's very clear she could go around, you know? Yep. Yeah, you want to be better than Diablo. Well, that's the kind of... <laughs> we, we, yeah, we... we it, it, we want to put our resources in the right places. We don't have the budget and the time to be making anything like Diablo, but it could be a lot more fun than Diablo in some ways. Um, but yeah, let's keep the complexity down because whenever you introduce something that, that has a load of side effects, then, then you've got to say, is this the best place to be spending our time? Mm. Um, you know, because right now, what's the biggest fish to fry? What's the thing about this game that's least consistent with our vision for it? You know? hmm. Cool, so... We are on to the any questions section, unless anybody else wants a different section in the live stream. I'm going to keep it to an hour this time, I think. That's keep good. it a bit yeah. tight. Don't we normally say it's an hour and then we go for we an hour We do normally say it's an hour and yeah. go for an hour and So we're half. actually going to keep it to what we say. I think so, because otherwise we're, we're liars. Yeah. And we're not. So, Cool. Other questions, guys, about RP. I'm really looking forward to getting into teaching you this. It's a really hard one to work out at what level to teach and at what level to, 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 to make the game. Um, RPGs are one of the most complicated types of games and we're taking on not only making one of the most complicated types of games um, and putting it on the asset store but teaching it at the same time which is kind of two businesses in one but if anybody can do it we can do it so uh, yeah. you're in good hands of course uh, just to let you know who's doing what by the way um, in fact I'll put this in as a, as a 3B briefly um, is it no it's not worth it um, I am going to be focused on doing the development and teaching the development uh, Rick is going to be to focus on all the level design and game design and particle systems and, and, all, and a lot of the story writing and doing all of that and teaching you that in Unity, in Engine. Mikey's going to take a back seat. He's focusing on his assets course, which is coming out in, a, in, a, in about a week. And um, he's going to be doing all the art and, and managing the community, but not actually teaching content. That's the plan at the moment. Sam is focused on other courses and on internal work for ourselves. So, like, he's focused on uh, Unreal. So. So, uh, a good question here. Is the ability system part of the core combat system, or does this follow later? I'd say yes, it's part of core combat, but it's not going to be part of section one of the course. Section one of the course is really going to be what you're seeing there, getting the player moving, hitting enemies, basic level blocking out, um, and getting that up and running as soon as we can for you guys. And then the next step is going to be jumping into the, the more depth of combat, so having player attributes, Having, for example, strength, although we don't want to call it strength, we want to call it something more interesting. Uh, strength impacting players' damage, so low strength means a little bit less damage, higher strength means more damage. And showing you guys that system, getting some more complexity around the enemies and around the, the way the player attacks. So really digging into making combat richer and deeper. Yep. So. And we, like, like a good TV series, we aim to have cliffhangers, so uh, we'll finish the first section with something like what you've just seen, mm -hmm. and you'll be crying out for more like you are in the chat here, which will be good because that means you'll actually start and do the second section. Yep. Um, what will we do about the dialogue system? We'll, well, again, we, want, uh, we will start it from first principles, find out what 
what's needed. So if you just go and buy a dialogue system, you, you've still got to spend time understanding reverse engineering, learning the dialogue system. And you don't really know, unless you've tried from scratch, how much pain it's solving. So we'll start by writing our own dialogue system initially, and then we will also very quickly start looking and seeing what's there. So as soon as we get to the point where we're able to judge somebody else's dialogue system from the point of view of value for money, from the point of view of ease of ease of integration, we will start looking at those and saying, are there some out there that are suitable to be integrated into the course and can save us time? If so, we'll do it. Yeah. Um, if not, then we'll do it ourselves. We're not afraid to do it either way. The point is you should always ask these questions, you know, should we do this ourselves, or should we do it a different way? And, and it's the choices you make there that make your game unique, and it depends on the uniqueness you're going for. Yep. If we've got a fairly standard dialogue system, why we may as well just get it off the shelf yeah. to save time. So. I'm pretty interested as well in terms of the, the question you're asking there, will some plugin or asset be used for the dialogue system? Are you guys interested in creating with your bare hands from scratch, from nothing, the entire dialogue system, You know the inner workings of it, the coding of it, the whole mechanics, do you want to do it from scratch? Or are you more interested in the application of it? So how do I have something and then use it to create spectacular dialogue and branching dialogue and, and multiple endings, etc.? So what, what part of that whole process are you most interested in? Uh, that would be good for us to know if you... Yeah, so dialogue in depth just for its own sake. Yeah, so dialogue from first principles, uh -huh. um, because you want to know that. Or, the dialogue system, yeah, yeah. Or dialogue off the shelf, because you're more interested in, in just implementing it. Yeah. Yep. And the implications of it are, you know, the, core, the, the more we go into detail on dialogue, something else has got to give because there's a finite length of course and a finite amount of time we've got. So this is all a question of focusing intentions. So let us know. Yes, from scratch. I always want to do everything from scratch, of course, because, I don't know, I just like getting under the skin of things. But yeah. you, that's really at loggerheads with the idea of making a game quickly and effectively and not reinventing the wheel. Yeah. Yeah, and I think so. the assumption we have for most of it is that we'll be showing you how to build it from scratch, but then you'll have it so that if you're not, if there's one of the systems, we're going to have, what, 10 systems by the, game, by the time this thing's done, so many aspects of the game. If there's one that you're not interested in, then you can grab it from our repository and uh, at least know how it works, like understand it, but not necessarily follow the whole process from scratch. But, you know, as I think you guys are yeah, exactly. confirming so, that you want to see how to do things from the get-go, not just to be delivered the final product. Yeah, so I'll make a judgment on how much I show you that line by line. Um, but you will get a dialogue system, you will understand how it works, and you'll be able to reuse it. And it sounds like it's most likely to be our dialogue system rather than one we bought off the shelf. We may not write every single line of code with you, but we'll make sure that you understand it inside out and you're able to you know, yep. open book, reuse it. Okay. Um, Good stuff. Uh, the thing about teaching you at least a lot of the basics of that is that you can then do different types of dialogue systems. Oh, which is good. So, oh, um, prerequisites, Ninja Chimp. Yeah, you're right. This is not an ab initio Unity course. It presumes some existing knowledge. About uh, Having done about half the Unity course will be fine. I'll recap anything major that, that's important, but I will move too fast for somebody who has never done any Unity before, I think. I mean, they'll be able to follow. They'll be able to watch the video, pause it, and do what I do and get the same results. Yeah. Um, but they will certainly feel that they have skipped over some fundamentals. Uh, you can also... Do it as a beginner and just allow yourself to skip the fundamentals and kind of learn those by absorption. But it depends on what type of learner you are. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, There's a question at the top we didn't get to. Can you explain your expectations for the inventory system? Pick up, drop, give, use, etc. Yeah, good question. I think that's a, it's a scope question. And for what we'll do right from the start, it'll be the, the bare minimum in terms of the player can pick up items and then equip them to themselves. I don't know if we would have give, given that, given that this is we're designing this as a single player game, not a multiplayer game, and pick up, yes, pick up. Yeah, so probably not give, uh, not, not as a separate function, but might do a Diablo style drop and then somebody else can pick up. Right, right. If we need to, if the game design dictates that that's a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. If we can do pick up and drop, you can effectively do give because one person yeah. drops, the other picks up. Um, will the stretch goals be integrated from the start or added later? They'll m mostly be integrated from the start. Um, 
It depends which one. So if we take those two examples, post-processing, that's already in our prototype, actually. It's just slapped in our prototype so that we have post-processing there. But the game already doesn't look like a normal Unity game because of bloom, because of depth of field, because of a whole bunch of things, actually, that are going on in here. Because of the incredible artwork. Yeah, because of the incredible artwork. So um, well, it does look like a standard Unity game right now, actually, because we've been very conservative on those things. Yep. But in terms of adding in these things and color correction, etc., we're already planning to do that from the word go. And Rick will get in, tweak that, and start to make it look like the game is supposed to look, and Michael. Um, but yes, we've already got that from the beginning, and it will improve as the art style comes through. The uh, character creation would be something we do a lot later because customization, because you can get into the game and play it and enjoy it without that. So we'd be focusing more on the core moment. But yes, that will certainly end up in the main course. It won't be bolted on the end, I wouldn't have thought, because it's kind of key to an RPG. It's one of the first things the player wants to do when they open an RPG, right? It's just character, uh, customize the character. How long will it be? Uh, probably a lot of lectures, maybe 400. Um, where if you're releasing on Steam, we are. When will we green light? Um, well, I was reading today that they're going to scrap green light, so it's going to be a different. We'll have to call it something else. It'll be get on Steam as opposed to green light. Uh, who knows when they'll do that? Uh, Valve's always talking about changing things up, but it looks like green light might nearly be at the point where it's going to be evolved. Um, how long? So the question is, how long in terms of months, weeks, and months, I guess, until we're actually done with the course? That might be one part of the question. Yeah, well, the course is going to take all year to do. Yep, all uh, year. Um, but at the very end of the year, it'll all be about, you know, how do you patch and update your game and, you know, all Steam stuff. And it might slip. The whole project might slip. We'll, we'll try not to let it, but we're going to do the best we can. Yeah, but at this point, the idea is for, for us Garby? to be launching... <laughs> Gabe. Oh, Gabe. Gabe. Oh, Fred. Gabe, sorry. Gabe. It does look like Garby, doesn't mm, it? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, wasn't Good that the got gorilla him, yeah. that got shot recently? Garby? Yeah. yeah. Was that Marengue? Yeah, was Gabe, I get it, I get it. I, oh. I've got a big microphone boom between me and the uh, between me and the screen, so I can't oh, yeah. see everything as well. <laughs> um, what was I talking about? Uh, oh, yeah, so for us to have uh, a game in some sort of early access before the end of the year... <clears throat> and for you guys to see that whole process as we go. Yeah. Another uh, course on MMORPG, sure. So the, we would love to do that. That's the ultimate goal of teaching, if we can teach that. Um, we are, Sam and I are starting to talk about a, mul a, a multiplayer course. Um, and that would be the first step, right, is to teach you multiplayer from the ground up. And once we've taught you multiplayer from the ground up, then we will... Um, let me put this in as, a, as an item I'm going to talk about. I'll finish by talking about that. Uh, what kind of rate will we be receiving lectures? I would hope you'll be getting, um, I would hope you'll be getting about three a day, something like that, in the weekdays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ten a week. You know, I know that's a little bit less than three a day, something like that. Um, I won't index this subject. I'll just tell you about the multiplayer course. Uh, we we don't have a multiplayer course yet, but we are thinking about it, and it's going to go something like this. Um, if you want to learn multiplayer from the ground up, I know this is a bit off off topic, but I might as well just cover it as you've asked. Then. We will probably start with the, a, a game like Pong, two-player, on the same screen. It's about how do you share a game state between two people on the same machine, no issues of, of anything. It's very simple. It's just how do you share the screen, how do you share a game, a common game space. Then we'd move on to a split screen, which is a little bit different because you've both got a different replication of the same world, but no issues around latency or lag or packet loss. Then we'd split out and say, okay, how about if we were two people to play a game over a network? What, what would that introduce in terms of the possibility of latency, packet loss, etc.? But a local network. Then we'd talk about the internet, where you're much more likely to get longer latencies. And then we'd, and the, the ultimate goal of that would be to show you to talk about the structure of a massively multiplayer online game. But that's a huge topic. Uh, but there are third-party services that would help with that um, and cool platforms you can build on. So and once we've done that, maybe an MMORPG. Mm -hmm. cool. uh, there, was, there was a follow-up question before when we were talking about inventory, which was sell to merchants. I can, see, I can see, yes, us doing selling to merchants. I don't see that as being all that different to the inventory system. Yeah, if we get some good, uh, you know, modules that we can reuse and they're really helpful for RPGs, we will probably put them on the asset store. Oh, I uh, think or maybe one. You know. hey, they're talking about in-game merchants. Oh, in-game so merchants, going to sorry. A shop. I was answering a different yeah. question. Well, I think Brian's asking about shop. Maybe he's talking about merchants taking it. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> sorry. I thought he was, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but yes, also, if we make a really useful pack, we'll put it on the stop. But in-game merchants, probably we've got to have one of those. We've already yeah. mentioned that. It's got to be there. I think if you've got inventory and you're able to pick up things and equip things and drop things, then dropping and selling yeah, is pretty similar. It's just... You've got a bit of go sell your swag. Yeah. 
Yes, in so, game shops. Cool. Todd, maybe make an advanced course on based on the assumption that the student has taken your Unity intro, and maybe this course as well. Yeah, eventually we'll be making advanced courses, don't worry. But we've got a bit more to do on beginner courses to cover the spectrum and a bit more on intermediate first. Um, yeah, okay, cool, guys. So I think we'll start wrapping this puppy up. <laughs> mm -hmm. and we've had a good session, a bit quicker than usual, which is, which is good as far as I'm concerned because it doesn't take quite so much of your time to, to, to participate in or to watch. You know what it is as well? I think our technology worked within a minute or two. Last time it was uh, yeah. probably 20 minutes of getting things Yeah, working, last time so. we were together. So the next stream is already announced. If you go to the community site and you go to RPG Early Access and the Early Access links, the uh, link for the next one is here, number four. Okay, So that is already set up. You can already go and, uh, go and click through to that uh, and wait for two weeks if you want, but that would be crazy. Uh, please do give a like to the video if you like the video. Not that we're pu not that we're trying to market this on YouTube uh, because it's private. All of this stuff is private. These videos will all be made public, by the way. When the early access period ends in March, we will make all these live streams public, but not till then because you guys have the privilege of getting a jump on it. But give us a like. Give us a subscribe. Oh, it would actually really help if you subscribe because we are looking to get our YouTube channel to 1,000 subscribers backwards. We're trying to do that before we really make a decent job of the YouTube channel. The reason being is we want to set ourselves up with a premium YouTube channel so that that we can give you guys a different way of consuming course content as well as alongside Udemy. Um, but to make a premium channel, we've got to have a thousand subscribers. So if you could just scrape the barrel and get all your mates to just subscribe to the Game Dev TV YouTube channel, then that would be really cool. And then we will get to a thousand. When we get to a thousand, we will start putting course content on there, including the RPG, which will be cool. So yeah, the commit history is big. Yeah, uh, loads of stuff in there, loads of messing around, lots of discussions about, you know, we're always thinking about um, not just putting the thing together because that's relatively relatively simple, but how putting it together in a way that's going to be teachable. So um, it's going to be fun when we uh, when we start teaching this out. If you want to get to the repository, I will give you a link to the repository now. I'll just quickly show you on screen uh, how you would get there. So you would start with this link, prototype repo. And our branch names will be changing all over the shop. So that's where you go. You get to game. And then the first thing you need to do when you get to game is think about which branch you're on. If you go to court, if you just sit here, you're not going to see much. Our game consists of a .gitignore file and nothing else. So if you want to yeah. see, uh, the, there were always going to be a few other um, branches. We were doing branch by task, so these weird codes. Uh, it's probably going to just change the name. So if you want to see where I'm up to, you go Ben. If you, and I will always be the one who does the major merges, so uh, that will tend to be the one you want to be looking at. You could also look at Rick, Al, Michael. Those branches will give you a very similar history. If we look at Get Kraken and you look where we are now, Ben's here, Rick's here, so their history is almost identical. Michael, when we change the name, will be just not too far behind. So uh, generally look at mine and that will tell you uh, where we are. Um, or just go and pull the repository into Git Kraken or similar. And we'll be showing you how to do that in the course. The course will have version control all the way through it. When Rick and I use version control, we will both be talking you through it. I'll be talking you through it in a slightly more developer technical way. And Rick will be trying to relate it to you for those of you who are less technical in a way that you can understand just like I'm, you know. So we'll use different terminology kind of purposefully. Uh, but we'll also try and align and use the right words for things like commit and pull and push. So there, was, there was a question we missed from Kenneth. How much will be dedicated to the process around making the RPG game beside the coding? And I think, I think you're asking there about the, the project management side of things, not just the design process of things. Um, so I think we're going to be talking about that throughout and, and splashing it in. It's not going to be a full-on, let's take you from start to finish of how to be a project manager and how to manage a team or how to work together, but you'll see... Uh, ben and I working together. I think that'll be a fairly obvious part of the course itself. And so watching over our shoulder... And with Michael providing assets but not appearing in the course. So that's mm -hmm. the sort of thing where if you were to hire an artist, for example, the way that we'll be interfacing with Michael will be very much like how you would interface with a hired artist. Yeah. Which I think would be really interesting for you to see. And at any point throughout the course, after we, I think after we push out the first section, that's when you guys will have a big uh, vote in terms of what you want to see. So if a lot of you are saying, we want to know more about the behind the scenes, how do you set yourself up? How do you communicate? Tell us more about how you're, you know, you get repository. Tell us more about your documentation. Then we'll, we'll dig into that in more details. But at the very least, you're going to see how we do our documents with our Google Docs system, how we um, share our code and how we work on the project Ben's looking at here at the moment. 
Um, and you'll see how we communicate, which is normally Ben giving me crap and then me giving him crap. So you'll be right in the driver's seat to see how that works. So most of it you'll be absorbing through osmosis and uh, able to ask us any questions you've got uh, as we go. Cool. Todd, I think you're asking about how do you do it. Just ignore the end depend stuff. That was a plug-in I was trying. Um, you, we can just forget that, um, move in a level, just download all of this basically, um, or clone it. If you know how to use source control already, that'd be much better, but you could just download this as a zip, go into assets, go into levels, and then just run the, any of these levels, um, which would be anything ending in dot unity, Ben's combat sandbox or Rick's village dot unity. That'll work. So just ignore that stuff at the top level, the end append stuff. I will actually delete end append out of this when I next do a cleanup. Does that answer your question, Todd? It's not, a, there's nothing weird about that. It's a dependency mapping man tool that I temporarily played with and it's just left some files in there. It's very, very messy. Everything about this prototype repo is very rough and ready and messy uh, because we are not, you know, it's only for you early access people. Although it will kind of be in the background for everybody else if they ever wanted to see it, if they want their eyes to bleed. All right, guys, wicked. Thank you very much. I think what we're going to do is, shall we do a fi literally five or six minutes AMA on the forum? Um, on the quarter past the hour in like seven minutes. Yeah, why not? We'll do a quick voice AMA over on the forum. So if you want to continue this, join us over on the Game Dev TV forum. We will be in the voice lounge in uh, at quarter past the hour for a quick AMA with a lot of people. So hope to see you there. Thanks, guys. See you later. See ya.